Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. Hello, and welcome to episode 166 of Mythos Busters. I'm Sean, and joining me tonight, it's it's been a Saturday, it's been a rainy Saturday, so I've been just like inside, just enjoying media, like one of those rainy Saturdays. I'm so mm. excited to talk Arkham tonight. Uh, joining me, of course, is, uh, you heard him, it's Scott. Hey, Scott. Yep. Hi. Was, was it also rainy where you were? Uh, no. <laughs> Yesterday it was. And uh, funny tangent on that, uh, my cell phone was pinging off a cell phone tower that was probably 45 minutes away from me for some reason, uh, and mm. they got a tornado warning, so I got a pop-up on my phone saying, seek shelter immediately, there's a tornado. <laughs> <laughs> and it it's sent me... You all the way to Canada. It sent me... a little PTSD. Reeling. Reeling. <laughs> I was like... Like... No, like legitimately started breathing quickly, and I was like, oh god, it's happening again. Oh, oh. <laughs> Yep. So, for anyone who's who's unaware, uh, last year at BusterCon, Scott, it it was a BusterCon or was it uh, Virtual Iron Man two years uh, ago? Virtual Iron Man. Yeah, I, I think it was two years ago. Scott experienced his first tornado drill in Minnesota at my place, and yeah. you know, I it's it's kind of funny because I like seeing it objectively. I know how frightening it must be, but I'm just like every first Wednesday, twelve Wednesdays a year, I hear that shit. Mm. And uh, it, it doesn't even phase me at this point. I'm, I'm going to jump in. To be fair, mm-hmm. it wasn't just a tornado siren. True. It was the type of storm where it should be light out, and it was not light out. It was as basically as dark as night because of mm-hmm. the storm rolling in. Yes. Mm-hmm. The sky was terrifying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that was Justin, and we've also got Ian. Hey, Ian. Hello. How was weather where you were at? Do you guys still have weather at all in Ca- in California? Is, is it just <laughs> well, California I would kill weather? for some rain right about now because mm. um, <clears throat> we're firmly in Sacramento summer now, so it's rocking like hundred plus uh, temperatures most of the days lately. Hmm. Yeah, as not as not Minnesotans are fond of saying, at least it's a dry heat. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dry one ten. A dry one ten. Dry is what my desiccated body will be by the end of it. Mm. <laughs> Get some Ian jerky. Excellent. <laughs> uh, well, I hope the weather's fine where you're at whenever you listen to this. Uh, we've got a, a wonderful episode for you guys tonight. I'm very excited about it. We're going to get through our openers, catch up on some news, check in with our patrons. Uh, and then to, uh, we've... Oh, no, no, no. Okay, we've also got voicemails. Before I get too far, I'm very excited about the voicemails tonight. We did get some uh, silver bullets that people wanted to add to our list from last episode. So we'll go through those. And then we've got another puzzle that I have no clue on. And we'll we'll put it out there, what we know, and and we'll see if we can figure it out live. And if not, then we'll, we'll rely on everyone else to give us hints. And then, of course, when we get to our actual discussion topic tonight, we are going to be talking about uh, Two Handed Solo. Just mm. as a as a concept, as a as a practice of play, uh, this is going to be our two handed solo primer, and I couldn't be more excited. It's my thing, and uh, then of course we'll round it out with some technical time. Yep. But before we get to any of that, uh, Justin, what's been going on? What what do we got for news? Uh, we got a we got a bunch this time. Uh, standing item uh, between now and BusterCon is reminder BusterCon is coming up. BusterCon 2024, September 19th through 22nd at the Game Center uh, in Roseville, Minnesota. We've got a room block at the Doubletree. Tickets are available on the Game Center's website. Um, just search BusterCon and you should find our, our webpage that has all the info. We're starting to get uh, some of the events planned right now. Uh, so if you have any thoughts on events you would like to see we'll have some of the old favorites you know the massive multiplayer some other things but if you have anything you would like to see uh, or if you're interested in volunteering we're trying to find some people so that i don't have to sit at the front desk the whole time (laughs) (laughs) um uh just shoot us a a message uh, at mythosbusterspot at gmail.com and uh, we'll start up a conversation we'd love to hear from you And would really love to see as many people as possible at BusterCon. So we're recording mid-June. And I think from what we've heard, we're already uh, 
booked up to 75% of where we were at last year. So I think it's going to be even bigger and better this year. So BusterCon oh, yeah. is going to be great. Mm-hmm. Uh, next news item, it's June. Uh, and it's only mid-June, so we're actually kind of on track for us. Uh, but our Pride <laughs> merch is back up. Happy so, Pride! Yeah. Uh, it's over on mythosmerch.com. Uh, if you click on any of the um, Pride items, then there's a little label you can click. We'll also have a link in the show notes. Uh, I think we have 10 or 12 different things. If there's anything else you'd like to see with the the uh, Mythos Busters Pride logo on and we don't have it on the store, shoot us a message. I'm, I'm happy to see if we can... Uh, can get it made because we do the the print on demand stuff through the store so it's it's pretty easy to to try some different options mm. uh let's see g uh, strings <laughs> <laughs> Too much? so you joke you joke but do you remember a few years ago when someone joked about underwear for it <laughs> just just about the logo in general uh-huh and i i made it i, I didn't mm. actually print have them print it but it's doable hmm so well, let's yeah. chat after the show. Yeah. Right. <laughs> New Mythos Busters uh, BusterCon uniform. <laughs> <laughs> um, next one is one we haven't done this for for quite a while. Um, we're just putting it in the news section, but we haven't asked for reviews in a while. Um, so we're asking for reviews just because why not, right? We we love to help spread the word, get more people into the Arkham community. Apple Podcast is usually where the reviews seem to live the most. So if you have two minutes and you have thoughts on what we're doing here um uh, it you know how, how you're interacting with the community as a result of listening to the podcast just throw something up there uh we'd love to get a few more of those rolling just to keep them current next item on the list uh oh ffg finally announced the insmith expansion repackage mm-hmm. um yeah uh i think that's you know not anything unexpected but uh it's nice that <laughs> we're finally caught up a wave of collectors and people who appreciate consistent storage just breathed the largest breath of of, of <laughs> recent uh, memory. Oh my god! Yeah. Yep. So yeah, it's it's nice they're done with that, and then uh, I'm curious if they have anything else planned to to you know fill the space as those keep getting reprinted. Or I I don't have any insight into that. To to be clear, I'm not I'm not being cagey about it, but I, I'm just generally curious. Mm-hmm. Um. Oh, this next one. Next one is super fun. So, Shadows Over Scotland. So, we got a message from uh, our, our blood blood feud foes over at Drawn to the Flame. Uh, and our so BFFs, they're working... our blood feud foes. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's going to stick. I'm, I'm yep. running with that one. Uh, so, they're working in collaboration with uh, Los Archivos de Arkham to do a three-day gathering focused on Arkham. Uh, they will actually be kicking off September uh, with these events. So September 6th through 8th at Tabletop Scotland in Edinburgh. Uh, It's focusing on playing Arkham, Epic Multiplayer, and then having some social time in the evening. It it sounds very much like what we like BusterCon to be, uh, but it's across the pond. And more people can hopefully uh, get to play with... uh, fellow Arkham fans in person. Sounds like it'll be a great time. Mm-hmm. So check out Drawn to the Flames episode on it for more details or check out uh, tabletopscotland.co.uk website to register. Hell yeah. Yeah. And if, you, if and you're planning on... pictures when you go. Yeah, please do. We'd love to hear about it. If they uh, are able to do this in future years too, I'd love it if we'd be able to go at some point. Mm-hmm. That would be cool. I'm missing yeah. it. I'm... I'm traveling to Europe with my family in October, so I'm missing it by, by just a month. I was they, so close. Yeah. They, you know, knowing them, they probably did that on purpose. I know, I know. Yeah. We talked. Those guys. We talked. Yeah. Those BFFs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, Ian, I've got you down to talk about the Gen Con scenario. Yeah, so they uh, released an article recently. It's it's always nice when we actually get articles on the FFG website these days, <laughs> not to throw too much shade. But um, oh uh, man, just we've talked about it before, but like the ages past where it was a regular place to check. Yeah, they used to post articles like pretty much every weekday, uh, like in mm-hmm. the the golden era but uh yeah the before um, times. i am not gonna be too salty about it though because like we are still getting like 
Arkham content um, all the time, and the game is healthy where so many other games have fallen by the wayside. So I won't sure. uh, I won't jinx it too much. I'm just happy to be keep getting stuff for this game we love. Um, so we talked before about how they, you know, we got the event listing for the Midwinter Gala, which is the Gen Con scenario. Uh, but then they also released this article to kind of go over, you know, some more of the mechanics and what it's all about. So we won't go too into the, um, weeds of like individual cards cause we usually don't for this type of like scenario, um, reveal, but there are a couple of cool things in here cause we, we were kind of like wondering about some of the elements like how it exactly the competitive mode is going to work etc and they kind of revealed some of that here so the main story looks like you know the players are gathering for a gala as you might expect from the name uh but there are five different factions who are kind of vying with each other to get control of this jewel this relic that is at the gala um, and so you're going to be able to ally with one of these factions. So one of them is the Foundation, which they're like the cops, basically. Um, <laughs> then there's Miskatonic University, so the nerds. Um, then there's the <laughs> Syndicate, basically mobster types. Uh, the Silver Twilight Lodge, which are everyone's the goths. favorite or not favorite creepy cultists. I like, I like then... the goths. That's good. <laughs> yeah, the goths. Yeah, we should really... I kind of started with that theme, but we should assign one of the classic like uh, school clicks to each of these. Well, I mean, <laughs> the mob are definitely just the greasers. Yes. Uh, we got the nerds already, and the foundation are what? like The jocks, for sure. The jocks, yeah. And then the locals of Kingsport is kind of everyone Townies. else. <laughs> Just, just the people who don't really fit into any of the cliques, which in real no, life, just the people who live in the people. city where the party is at, like they yeah. just live there. Yeah, I mean, for at first glance, I'm, I'm imagine this will probably fall along cl- class lines. But what faction hmm. are you all feeling that you would want to ally with in the game, not necessarily in real life? I mean, yeah, definitely the goths. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. not surprised. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Uh, we have our Gen Con plan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would probably lean Syndicate, which is like class lines, but yeah, I. Okay, that's cool. You're overvoted. You're you're outvoted. We gerrymandered this long ago. <laughs> you're, you're behind the game. Are you sure? I mean, you're I'm not, not, I'm not going foundation? to Gen Con. <laughs> I'm not going to Gen Con. So do I even get a, a vote? I'm not even sure. Yeah, you're the gerrymander, and we give you a vote anyway, even though you're a disinterested party. <laughs> hmm. I mean, the the cool thing is, I imagine, like, beyond Gen Con, this is going to be a fun one to play at events, uh, because, like, the way it works is, like, you ally with a faction, and then one of the other factions becomes your rivals, um, and then there are various, like, guests at the party, depending on what faction you're you're aligned with, you can potentially recruit them. And if you're playing this as part of a campaign, you can even get these as allies to your deck, which is fun. Like, it looks Love like that. there's a ally version of Carl Sanford. So some of you know pretty well from past C&D. campaigns. <clears throat> um, but then the semi-competitive mode, very interesting. So it's going to be semi-competitive because you're you're all still trying to like get this relic. But now each group, each each faction is essentially competing with each other. There's some kind of points that you get for doing different things in the scenario. And the group and their faction that gets the highest score is the winner of this best guess variant. So that sounds like a really fun mode to run at various conventions because, you know, it, it runs up to five groups and you can see who comes out on top there. Yeah. Sounds fun. Awesome. Will fine clothes be amazing in this scenario? Do you know <laughs> I feel like it has to. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm I'm running it based on theme. I don't even care if there's a rule that says you can't use it for some reason. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, is Alessandra going to be banned from semi-competitive for being too <laughs> OP? <laughs> no, she'll just be the meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. It probably bears mentioning that, yeah, aside from Scott, all of us are, are going to be at Gen Con, so we'll 
hopefully be able to report back pretty quickly on what this experience is like in a, in a spoiler free mm. manner, of course. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'm really hoping that we can get a hold of enough copies to, to make at least a couple passes at this possible at BusterCon. But that that's TBD. Yeah, that would be great. So far, it says it's going to be hitting store shelves sometime in August. So probably sometime after Gen Con, it should be generally available. So hopefully, hopefully by the time BusterCon comes around, everyone will kind of have access to it. But we'll see. I've been hurt before by release dates. <clears throat> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Excellent. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Well, I probably should have mentioned it when we were talking about Drawn to the Flame, but I guess I'll, I'll throw it in here. Um, so last month for for our extra content, I got in a level or a session zero build stream, I guess, for my Diana through the edge of the earth campaign. Uh, chat was was kind enough to, to gift me edge of the earth so I can get more runs in before Iron Man. Or maybe everyone else wanted to see more things before Iron Man 2. I don't know. Yeah. Either way, it's Diana through Edge of the Earth, so go check that out. And then, uh, most recently, I was able to stream with our BFFs. And, boy, Ice and Death Part 1 uh, was fun. So so I guess it bears mentioning the Diana deck build. I let chat decide whether I was going to toss basic weaknesses back until chat decided, no, we get to keep this one. Hmm. Guess what they stuck me with? Oh, is it uh, the belt holes one? No, but it's oh. one up from that, in my opinion. An offer you can't refuse. Yeah, yes. So they stuck me with an offer you can't refuse, and that has been, <laughs> that has been interesting. So anyway, we played Ice and Death Part 1. It was wild. Uh, we talked about solo and, and turn uh, evaluation a lot as we played. Uh, so go, go check that out on the old YouTube and Twitch. Ian, what we got going on with our patrons? Yeah, so um, first off, as always, we got to give a thanks to our board members. That's Chris B, Chris H, and Chris M, our conglomeration of Chris's. Morton, Jared, Ian, Philip, Patrick, Abilio, Jesse, Chad, Robert, and Walker. Thank you so much for your huge, huge contributions to everything we do. And as always, we pick out a random patron to give a shout out to. And this time around, that random patron is Sleepy. <laughs> and I'm saying it that way because <laughs> their uh, patron username it has three E's in Sleepy. So Sleepy. Very you were sleepy. breaking up a little there, Ian. What was that again? Sleepy. <laughs> sorry, sorry, one, more, one more time? Sleep. Okay. <laughs> it's going to get worse every time you realize. <laughs> it's getting more awake every time. <laughs> Um, so I hope they enjoy their time in the dreamlands because based on their username, that sounds like that's where they're going. Um, and I think that's about it for the patron business this time around, but, uh, just know we, we love all of you. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I suppose, uh, related to our patrons, distant voices update. I am, uh, as far as recording and editing goes, I am almost to the end of Hemlock Vale. I have three entries to go through that they're uh, you know albeit there are three of the meatiest entries of course because they're toward the end Mm -hmm. so look forward to that north is in the process of getting everything into the arkham cards app i want to say we're up through like thing in the depths don't quote me on that um but uh, it should be hopefully by the time our next episode drops all of that is in the bag and, and ready for everyone to go so Thanks everyone for your patience. It's been a it's been a, a go this time. Mm. What's interesting about Hemlock Vale, and this is non spoiler. This is this is like formatting spoilers, I guess. Um, but while it is shorter than the Scarlet Keys by like word count, it has far more entries, like single entries that need to be recorded, mm. edited, and separated. Mm. So okay, I am in just as many hours on hemlock as i was on scarlet keys despite the fact that it's like something like what like 30 percent but for shorter by word count yeah mm, yeah interesting so, yeah yeah just a little peek behind the curtain there anyway thanks to, for everyone's patience while uh, that takes me longer and uh, we'll be done with it soon all right moving on then to voicemails 
Uh, so if you listened to last episode, you'll know that we talked about silver bullets or cards that are particularly efficient in certain campaigns or, or scenarios. Uh, and we had a couple of people call in to add to our list. So let's rock through those. Hey, Mythos Busters. Uh, this is Autumn on Discord. I'm Autumn, number one Rita fan. And I just listened to your episode about silver bullets, and I've got three uh, three more silver bullets to add to your list. Um, the first one is uh, level two, Mind Over Matter, against uh, the Circle Undone. Um, this is the version of the card that adds your intellect to your combat or your agility for the round. Um, and I think this is super useful in the scenarios where the party is split up and the Kluver might have to do a little bit of combat or evade an enemy, but also against the circle tests in um, in the third to last scenario, this mm. card just ter- just turns your stats up to you know well over 20 for those circle tests, um, especially when you're testing every single one of your stats because you're adding your intellect to your combat and your agility. Um, my next silver bullet is uh, Moonlight Ritual Level Two um, against the spider side of the dream eaters uh this card fast zero cost just lets you remove all the doom from your location um that scenario you can sometimes get out of control with a number of doom on a location so the ability to just remove all of it kind of trivializes the scenario a little bit Um, and my third silver bullet is uh against the scarlet keys it's alice luxley and i think any clover that can take alex alice luxley um, in the Scarlet Keys really wants to because the ability to expose a concealed mini card um, when you discover a clue is super duper useful. Um, I, I also think I also think Rex Murphy is kind of a silver bullet against the Scarlet Keys for similar reasons. But anyway, those are my three silver bullets. Uh, thank you for the episode and take care. I must say the the Moonlight Ritual level two that is a mm. good call out. Mm-hmm. The amount of campaigns that would have been saved if that card had been in a deck. <laughs> oh boy, that's yep. one I often forgot to forget about because I just think of it in terms of like I don't know Renfield play or something or just yeah. like removing doom for your own cards. But yeah, thinking about it in terms of other um, yeah. like scenario specific uses is interesting. Did oh, Ian I... just name a did Ian just name a new kink there with Renfield play? <laughs> <laughs> I mean I don't think the kink is new, but maybe the name is new. <laughs> <laughs> now I know what to call that part of my brain. <laughs> it's a kink as old as time. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I do have to double down on on Luxley. That is the most success I've ever had, the best I've ever felt about playing Luxley was in the Scarlet Keys for sure. Uh, Just for uh, pinging those decoys. It's a very good way to do it. All right. We'll move to the next one. Hey, Methos Busters. This is Jesse, known as Ancient Eldritch Horror around the place. I was calling in reference to the latest podcast, uh, at least as of when I'm uh, making this phone call, about silver bullets. Um, One of the silver bullets... uh, One of the silver bullet cards, I think, is uh, almost elevated to a point of just always really useful, uh, is shortcut level two. Uh, Anytime you have a grid map with nine locations or or you have a location with a central location that you're going to have to go through a lot, shortcut level two uh, elevates you to to being like a silver bullet. For example, in Midnight Mass, me and my friend Chris, Big Kahuna, um, we actually ended up getting all the cultists in a draft format in Midnight Mass solely because, well, we did well, but the Silver Bullet was shortcut level two. Shortcut level two is also really useful uh, anytime you have three or four players. Um, and at that point, it's just so good uh, on a map because you know that it's going to get a bunch of uses out of it. It's fast. It doesn't cost much. It doesn't cost a lot of XP, but it saves a lot of actions. 
Um, so that's something that I would suggest as a silver bullet for, especially uh, Midnight Mass uh, and Dunwich and uh, quite a few places in Carcosa, especially if you have two of them. The other thing I wanted to talk about was Edge of the Earth, since we're coming up on Iron Man here soon, um, and Tekalili. Now, we all know that random is random. So one of the ways I deal with uh, keeping track of how many Tekalili cards are in your deck after a game, especially if you're not doing it in Iron Man format, where you keep your decks together or you're going to play one scenario right after the other, um, I just count the number of Tekalili cards in my player deck or in each uh, investigator's deck, record that, and then when I go to the next session, because random is random, I just shovel up the Tekalili deck, deal out that many cards to each deck and shuffle them in. At that point, you can look at them or not. I think it's more fun not to look at them, even though it's obviously harder. But um, it makes uh, keeping track of Tekalili a lot easier and uh, the people I've played with uh, that we've used that uh, have really liked that system. So uh, that might make it a little easier for those of you out there playing and keeping track of the tech lately. Anyway, love what you guys do, and uh, looking forward to the next recording. Have fun. Huh. I'll be first to admit, I do that tech lately thing too. When I'm not playing straight through and I'm being focused, like I, I bounce between campaigns all the time and... It's tough to tell. I will just count it out and make a note and shuffle in random ones. I think that's completely reasonable. Mm. Yeah, I think that's fine. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jesse and Autumn. We appreciate your input. And uh, the window's still open for everyone else. If you have silver bullets, if you'd like to let us know about particularly focused, awesome uses of cards, please always feel free to call that in uh, to the Mythos Busters hotline. That's 203 693 no, wait, 493-6984. Now let's move on to the next one. Graham here, long-time listener, first-time caller, Kilogram on Discord. Uh, I was listening to your Silver Bullets episode, and I thought it was really awesome. Thanks for making that. Um, it got me thinking about a pretty simple question I wanted to pose to you all. Uh, without getting into too many deck-building specifics or combos or getting too sweaty, now we're like eight or so years into the game, who do you think is the best investigator and why? For me, I've seen her in about four or five campaigns or played her, and I have to say, I feel like Trish Scarborough seems like she has a very easy time just dancing through most scenarios. She definitely gets hit hard by, you know, rotting remains and the like, but otherwise, it feels like she has Rex's ability and Finn's ability kind of like on tap whenever she needs them, and she just has a very easy time being either a cluer or an enemy manager or both. Anyway, curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks for all you do. Bye. Heavy question. Yeah. She's up there. <laughs> I do agree. <laughs> Trish is great. Yeah. Trish is great. And I have no idea how you'd even go about answering this question because there are so many qualifications yeah. and what ifs and like, all right, player counts and blah, blah, blah. Um, but like general gut shot, you get like one sentence to qualify. Who do you think is currently the best investigator? Ugh. <laughs> I can go first if you guys need to yeah, say yeah. yeah, go for it. <laughs> I have no idea. I know. Uh, so, know. gut shot for me. <clears throat> gut shot. Gut hip shot. Not the gut check. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Shooting from the hip uh, for me, it would be Gloria. And that is because mm. she's she's got a great stat line for, for most situations. And her skill to scry and set up the encounter deck and manage and or just straight up remove encounter threats um, is it just on a fundamental level is so good mm. that I think no matter what, she'll always be toward the top of the heap. And she will only get more toys, not not less, you know. So, I, Sean, I'll jump in because I'm going to agree with you because my gut is I want to say Gloria because of the funky thing she does. If you couldn't say Gloria, who would you say? <laughs> <laughs> right. That That's that's the gut reaction because that's the part I'm struggling with on it of that's who I would go to. I've I've got my answer, I think. If, we, yeah. if we're – so I think Gloria is an excellent answer and I think that that's probably the correct answer. Well, I mean, 
Um, the only one that would contend with her, I think, is Luke. Sure. Because of his ability to break the game. But Gloria is... Oh, she's, she's so excellent at just controlling the game that you don't necessarily need Luke powers because she can just shut down the Engadder deck. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Ugh. And it's it's tough for me to like want to nominate a hard killer or hard kluver in right. this yeah. slot, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if we were talking about specialists, that's one thing. But I want to say like general awesomeness can kind of just be awesome no matter what. Yeah. Maybe Silas? Yeah. He's, he's got a lot of utility uses and some really, really ridiculous toys. That would be my answer after Gloria, I guess. But that is that is probably more me answering my pet investigator answer than than the real, you know, who is best answer. Right. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer besides Luke <laughs> or Gloria. <laughs> Ian, is what about uh, so I, I want to jump back quick so I know it's more of a the way we've run it has been more of a popularity contest but the last two March to Madness winners so we had Stella mm-hmm. and Ursula right um, yes I believe so again that's more a popularity yeah. contest but where would like how how close to the top would they be today for you guys they're both pretty high for me for sure um, yeah I I don't know if Stella has the reliability of Gloria, I think. Mm-hmm. Would be my argument. <clears throat> it's definitely not it's as been a minute since I played Gloria. Stella. Um, yeah. But so Stella falls into that general awesomeness category for me. Um, I really don't know who I would pick for this. Like, of course, I'm kind of biased towards a rogue investigator, but even then, there's a couple candidates. But like, I almost feel like a total dark horse candidate that people would probably not think of for this kind of question, like Tony, because although I love my evade investigators, like having played Tony in both multiplayer and solo, he just like feels like he can do it all, like because he can even do um, clue getting when he needs to. Even though people think of him as a hard killer, mm-hmm. true. Think dang Tony. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't know that that would be my actual answer, but eh. <laughs> I guess we'll have to take it. Man. Yeah. <laughs> 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 awesome. Excellent. Let's move on. Okay. So thank you to all of our callers who who gave us conventional questions and or comments. Uh, we love to hear from you. Everyone call in to the Mythos Busters hotline at 203-493-6984. I present to you now. <laughs> so you know how last last episode we had kind of a fun clue uh, voicemail that, mm-hmm. that someone just dropped, like, I think they're just dropping card numbers, right? Yes. Well, uh, sets and card numbers, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I think we have another puzzle before us here. We Mm. had three separate, very short voicemails left to us on different days from different numbers. And it sounds, I think, like they are different speakers. And I, I I can't make head nor tail from it. Uh, so let's play it here, and I don't know. We can kind of talk it out, and if we can't figure it out in, in short order, then we'll we'll bump it to the the our brilliant listeners who might figure mm. it out and give us a clue. Uh, but here is what we were given in the order that we were given it. Before the Black Throne, Act One A. The Essex County Express, Agenda One A. Yes, in time and space, Act. Two A. Huh. You now know what I know. Okay. <laughs> Gotta go to my old friend Arkham DB here. Uh huh. So I also I dropped him in the show notes here to make it easier. Okay. Ian. Thank you. So the first act, one act was. One? Act two A. I think it was before the Black Throne. Was it one A? It might have been one A. Yep, one A. Which is the Cosmos beckons. Terran reality. So, I'm, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so that's that's our starting point, and then we go to 
A Terror in Reality from Essex County Express, Agenda mm -hmm. 1A. And then we go to Into the Beyond, which is Act 2A from Lost in Time and Space. Hmm. <laughs> so, like, they're all from scenarios, and I, I like, we got to be careful of spoilers because this is, like, toward the end of, like, three different campaigns here. Wait, two different campaigns. Like, they're all to do with, like, other dimensions impeding on ours? Sure. Is that fair to yeah. say? Although that's also, like, half of Arkham, it feels like. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess. You throw a dart at Arkham and you probably hit something <laughs> that fits that description. The well, last time around, we got a puzzle in response to, like, a question we asked. So is there anything, assuming this is along the same lines, is there anything we mentioned or talked about? I was trying to think about that, but I I came up short. Yeah, because we were ta well, we were talking about silver bullets, right? So we probably did mm -hmm. talk about quite a few scenarios. Are these all just silver bullets to players? <laughs> no wait, one of them is an act. Okay, hang on. Yeah, well, or is there a, is there a silver bullet that addresses the three of these mm. things? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um. Now, see, the, here's the hard thing is a tear in reality really is the combo breaker here because it's yeah. an agenda that has no mechanical text. It is story text and four doom threshold. Yeah, because I, I, Cosmos beckons and Into the Beyond both let you do, like, some kind of location spotting type thing. But then, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know how tear in reality fits into that at all. Huh. Hmm. I'm stumped. Well, <laughs> yep. <laughs> Me too. Well, dear it, listeners, if because it, it doesn't have mechanics other than what it tells you to do when you flip it. Yeah. Well, then that's one B. So, like, I don't even think you look at the backs of any of these cards because they're A and B, and the the colors specified. Mm. So, like, I hesitate to even consider what what goes on on the back. Hmm. Hmm. Yep. All right. Well, dear <laughs> listeners, in, intrepid investigators, if you know, help us. <laughs> yeah. Because I am clueless as to what this is. Um, and I guess a preemptive thank you to those who left the messages. We'll see. We'll check back in after we figure out what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so if you happen to know what's going on, feel free to call it into the Mythos Busters hotline. That's 203-493-6984. We'd love to hear from you. All right, boys. Oh, wait, hang on. Is it just a haiku? Chad Chad posted, The Cosmos Beckons, a tear in reality. Is that six or seven? A That's seven. A tear reality, in, reality. in reality. Into the beyond. Yep. It might just be a haiku. All right. It's, it's a decent haiku. Yeah. Did I say haiku? You There's did. There's a diphthong yeah. there. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for pretending that I didn't say haiku. Yeah, it was definitely high Q. <laughs> I mean, what? Mm -hmm. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, that was fun. Thanks, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, and NBs. Uh, uh, that was that was fun to parse through. Keep the puzzles coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Let's move on to our main topic, guys. So, as mentioned, this one is near and dear to my heart. Uh, we'd like to talk about two-handed solo with you guys for a little mm -hmm. while. It's the way I've been playing pretty much since the game started. Well, no, definitely since the game started, because I was doing it for Lord of the Rings well before I ever did it for Arkham. Um, so what is two-handed solo, as opposed to true solo, which is one player playing one single investigator through a, mm -hmm. a scenario or a campaign? Um, Blank-handed solo means that one person is playing that many investigators uh through the game so like simulating team play but still playing as a solo player mm -hmm. simple enough so this often comes up um in you know new players uh joining i see this in the the new and arkham chat every once in a while it usually comes up that we we recommend that you learn the game just r running through true solo because that's the simplest way to go and to like learn the mechanics yeah um but a lot of people will say if you're having trouble with you know, deck building or difficulty in true solo or whatever it happens to be, two-handed might be a good way for you to go. Do you guys see that one a lot too? Yeah, I think definitely 
two-handed is, while it it's tough because if it's someone brand new, I think controlling two characters is more difficult than solo. But on the other sure. hand, it makes the game easier if you can handle the mental load. And that is that is a big part of our discussion tonight. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about why one might play two handed. I'll start because this is my biggest thing in true solo. Everything that happens, happens to you. Everything Mm -hmm. that is needed is needed from you. One single player. And due to the amount of random chance in this game, both from, you know, what the encounter deck throws at you and the, the crazy pulls that the the chaos bag can sometimes heap on you from time to time. It can be a real bad time in true solo to try to recover from a run of bad luck. So Mm -hmm. my biggest thing is that two handed diversifies encounter risks in that way. Mm. Like whatever you guys pull, you're spreading it over two people or two, two investigators, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, and it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. When you're Sean, I have, I have a question about that. And and for some background here, I've maybe done two-handed solo once or or twice. But again, that's a maybe I may not have because it would have been in the the intro scenarios. I've done true solo two to three times at most, but usually I'm I'm playing true multiplayer, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a I'm I'm really intrigued by this because it's a thing I would like to get into a little more because then I'd probably play more. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you're talking about diversifying the risks, is that purely a numbers game or is it a thing that you like spec for? And if I'm jumping ahead, we can come back to it later, but is it like, is it just by purely having another body on the field, it's diversifying it. And then like you would know what you're getting into and kind of build around it with stats or it is one more important than the other or more prevalent. Uh, in my opinion is both. Okay. Um, both, you know when when i build for two-handed solo i'm generally trying to make it so that like together they make one rounded investigator who can kind of kind of do most of the things that the game might ask uh we'll we'll kind of talk about deck building later but i try to make it so that one of my two investigators can hit just about any test or at least has a shot at it um Mm -hmm. you know like across the various skills that you might see um, but even beyond that sort of thing, I'm talking about like, okay, well, the encounter deck was stacked in such a way that you just drew three enemies in a row. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You do that in true solo and you're not like a hundred percent set up to deal with it. That's like, that's pretty much the game mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times. Um, so, you know, t- two players drawing three enemies gets a little bit easier than three turns of a solo game drawing an enemy every time. Does that make sense? So it's, it's just kind yeah, of like it's yep. smoothing out the different curves and angles and, and and amplitude of the difficulty of the encounter deck simply by simply by the virtue that another deck is there to potentially have a solution for it. Sure. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, like you I think you can have of course, better or worse two-handed setups, but I think even if you had the worst two-handed uh, decks possible, you still would have that advantage just by virtue of having two warm bodies because, yeah, <laughs> like, I think the biggest thing that comes up is just inherent in the rules of the game is opportunity attacks that if you have an enemy on you that you can't do certain things without taking damage, yeah. you add a second body and automatically you just have more options that they can like peel an enemy off someone, you know, take the damage here, take the damn horror here. You're just kind of like, I don't know, six actions to work with is automatically just feels like so much more, even if you're drawing two encounter cards. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I think that that just inherently makes the game easier. And then whatever mechanical deck building strategy you can layer on top of that uh, is is just gravy. Um, I also think, you know, this is a hot take that I've I've held for a long time, so it's probably pretty cool at this point. <laughs> but uh, Arkham Horror is a multiplayer game. It operates and works for True Solo, but like there are cards that are straight up unusable in True Solo. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, there are lots of cases where like the scaling is hard to obviously hard to dial in for true solo just because of what they want to do. I think it fights uh, it fights itself a little bit there. This is a multiplayer game with a solo option. So the ability when you're playing by yourself to still be able to play a guardian support deck, you know, you can play a Carson deck two handed solo mm-hmm. um, and, and it would be functional. You, you can't really do that. Well, OK. All right. Look, I don't want to start the true solo Carson conversation <laughs> again. I don't. But it's, I mean, like, come on. <laughs> we can all admit it would be yeah. harder, right? Yes. OK. All right. Non-controversial. Uh, and then if you're anything like me, it it just I have way more ideas for decks and builds and cards I want to try than I have time to play. So a nice benefit of two two handed solo for me is that I get to try two decks out. And yes, it's slower than true solo, but it is not slower than two campaigns would take <laughs> to do both of those decks through true solo. <laughs> True. Well, I think and, building building on your point to Sean that it's a multiplayer game that we can play solo. Um, I think you're right. There's certain there's certain cards that just kind of get blocked out on um, mm. on solo, and some of those cards are investigators. And there's just a bunch True. of investigators that I think are just like you. You could play them solo, like if you want to, but I think you're yeah. gonna have a bad time. Um, I mean, if you want, and like Scott, I, Scott, I know I'm, I'm putting you on the spot yeah. here, but can you give me a couple examples of them? Uh, yeah, I think, let's see. Okay. Carson is a, is a perfect right, example. Right, right. Yeah. But only because, and I'll like, I'll clarify that, that it's because he is built for multiplayer, right? Like mm-hmm. his power is for multiplayer. Yes, you can play him solo, but you're not going to feel what Carson is, um, playing multiplayer. Um, I've been trying to think about what the fuck to do with Hank in solo and I haven't cracked that one. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Hank's pretty rough. Um, I'm trying to think who was, oh, uh, goodness, what's her name? Min, Minty Fan. Sure. Like mm-hmm. she's decent, but I mean, I don't think you you feel what she does until you play multiplayer. Yeah, that's so. a whole another world. Yeah. It's like yeah, the investigators kind of got a hand tied behind their back inherently if there's no one else around. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think the other thing I definitely feel all that um, Sean in terms of like reasons to play two-handed and especially the variety thing uh and it's not even just like being able to play more decks but also weirder decks than you can do in true solo like we've talked about this before but like worth mentioning again like true solo you have to cover everything um i tend to like have to use just by nature of it more of the staples those cards that you kind of always use because Again, you have to cover everything. You have to be more efficient. Um, whereas in even adding one player two-handed, I can get weirder with my decks and put more mm-hmm. specialized stuff in there because you know they can work together versus just having to kind of have a little bit more of a constrained deck. Um, I, mm-hmm. It's not as bad as like <laughs> you know we t- had the same conversation a lot with uh, Lord of the Rings. Don't want to get too much into that, but. That game felt a Drink. lot more like, okay, like there's a true solo deck I have to build here and there's not much room. I feel like in Arkham mm-hmm. I can still kind of wiggle it a bit more, but it, it but true solo versus two handed, two handed you're just gonna be able to include uh more creative builds, I think. Yeah, I I would say that Lord of the Rings is the most brutal so true solo experience of the LCGs. I would die on that hill. <laughs> Arkham is at least a more civilized experience than that. A more civilized card game mm-hmm. for a more civilized mm-hmm. age or something. Of course, of course. Um, I think to one advantage, I, I don't play a whole lot of two-handed uh, solo. I just prefer solo. Mm-hmm. But one advantage, I think, is when you want to try out a concept where you're going to need like your second player to play a specific deck, and you... It's a lot easier... <laughs> to be friends mm-hmm. with yourself and hand yourself friend a, a deck that you want to be played across from you. If you get my drift, <laughs> like it's, especially if you want to take it through a campaign, if there's a specific like bless mechanic that you 
bless curse or I don't know something based on skills or whatnot and you're like okay I need the other person to be playing these 22 cards they can pick the other eight that's not really fun for another person <laughs> usually um, so being able to do that to yourself I think is a really easy way to get the experience that you're looking for yeah I suppose that's that's another thing that I kind of don't think about anymore it's so rare that I play with people who are coming with their own decks Mm. Like only at the big events does that ever is that a thing for me? I'm usually building for other people, but yeah, like the amount of coordination you can do in this game, albeit not as high as Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. is still a lot of fun to play around with. Yeah, it's tough to beat dwarves in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> it's true. Four four player dwarves is uh, nuts, especially pre errata. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we do have to talk about it. There are obviously some disadvantages. You know, there are so many people who choose to do true solo over two-handed solo, and, you know, there's got to be a reason or three why. Obviously, you need a little bit more table space, but I think the biggest one is that it is more brain space mm-hmm. to to run two decks and to, you know, work with all the multipliers, and it usually extends the game, even if, like, every action were the same amount of time. Because there's twice twice as many actions, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah. I mean, thinking for two decks, I find that even when I'm I'm in the zone, reactive triggers that play out of events in hand or or something like that, I find I miss those things occasionally uh, when I'm... You know, I'm focusing on the one deck, and the other deck could have done something, and I, I, I find myself forgetting things and having to retcon occasionally Mm -hmm. um so so it is definitely it's it's more of a you have to be more engaged more often with Mm -hmm. two-handed i have a follow-up with that sean so Mm -hmm. that that's one of my big questions about two-handed is so like when we're when you and i are playing or we're playing in a bigger group we're all kind of watching for that and we we can track it it seems like a and it might just be an internal thing for me, like a hurdle of, oh my God, now I'm solely responsible for this. What if I screw it up? Mm. Like it's, again, it's a hurdle to get past of, am I going to just mess this up and almost waste my time? Now, again, the flip side, that could be, "Ah, I don't care. Just move past it. I feel like it's a spectrum that there's somewhere in between, but did you have like a moment when you got past it or did you just push through it and be like, it's a game. It doesn't matter. Um, I mean, I'd be curious to hear from all of you. That's a that's both a, a two handed solo and true solo thing, but that's a, that's a hurdle for me. Yeah, I mean, I think I I'm weird because I was forged in the fire of posting my recorded games to the internet and letting other people comment on them. <laughs> so, like, you just kind of get over the fact that no matter how hard you try, and you know, I barely try hard anymore, you're you're gonna make mistakes. So. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like you roll it back when you catch it. If it's easy, you take the asterisk when you need to and just be like, all right, well, you know, I'm like if you're a mechanical purist and you're like doing speed runs and like purity is important to you, that's one thing. But most of the time, what I want is to try this deck out. And to experience a fun story and like uh, a new run of challenges with these scenarios that I've played before. And if it's not the cleanest game of Arkham ever, I can live with that. But, you know, I guess worst case scenario, you can always just replay this, replay the scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, like, no, playing more Arkham. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I've become fairly well known for being like a kind of rules stickler for my own games, at least. And like wanting to get everything right. But that being said, I've been playing like, solo gaming for so long like at a certain point you just accept you're gonna make mistakes as part of solo gaming Uh, that's true for true solo as well but two-handed does introduce more of that just because of the mental load but Mm -hmm. i think if you're going to go down the two-handed route um and just solo gaming in general at a certain point you just have to accept that there are going to be games where you make mistakes and there's probably many mistakes that you've made that you don't even know you made. (laughs) Sometimes you catch them, but you like similar, um, Sean, just having gone through doing streaming for both Arkham and Lord of the Rings, like 
the mistakes get pointed out to you, but I'm sure there's so many games we all play that you, we made mistakes and you don't even know it, which out of sight, out of mind, I guess. But like <laughs> you rewind when you can, but sometimes you can't. And it's just like, it goes both ways. Cause there's times like I miss things and like, Oh, if I would have done this, I actually would have done better in this scenario. Um, yeah, but then sure. other times it's like, Oh, I made it easier for myself. So it's like, they're not, you know, trying to cheat or anything. They they kind of balance out in my experience. And it doesn't feel good when, like, you get this cool win and then you remember that or realize something that you messed up. But I think it is a very kind of philosophical thing where you just have to be learn to be okay with it. And, like, follow your heart, man. Like, mm-hmm. if it's fine, it's fine. I had one recently where... No spoilers, but in Hemlock, there's a few enemies that have, like, a lot of damn keywords on them. Uh, And Mm -hmm. there was one enemy in particular that was kind of around for pretty much the whole scenario, and I missed one of its really important keywords until I was, like, ten turns in. And then I caught it, and I was like, oh, Mm -hmm. this would have been a completely different game if I had been playing that right. So that was one where I just scrapped it and restarted. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But just, just follow your heart. Yeah, okay. I I think one thing it does do is like the mental like we talked about kind of some of the disadvantage like the two handed does take more time like I I've been one that I've always like half the time I kind of play true solo half the time two handed um, and when I do true solo it's usually because I want a quicker experience but two handed is long not just because there's another player but because I tend to play slower two handed. Because I have to, like, really be organized and take my time. Otherwise, I know I am probably going to miss a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do find myself, like, talking through the phases yeah, a little bit more in my right. head. But the thing is, is that I will say, it's hard for me to remember this because I've been just doing this since the game came out. But, like, you do just kind of get into the flow of it after you get a few reps in. You know, and I've been away for a while, I feel that too, where it's like, okay, all right, here's your three actions, here's your three actions, all right, draw this deck, draw this deck, yeah, encounter, and you, like, you kind of, like, you find your flow, and you find it's, I don't know, part of the attraction of solo board gaming is just kind of, like, ritual movement of mm-hmm. cardboard and bits around, so. Mo- moving stuff around, man, that's. Yep, <laughs> truly. So I, I would say the there is a little bit of a hill to climb, but once you like get into the rhythm of it, it becomes significantly easier. Um, and I, we're going to talk about like general stuff later. But the other thing I will say is that a big quality of life change for any solo play. This doesn't apply just to two handed, but it, it applies. Okay, we'll get there. Anyway, for any solo play, it is a big quality of life improvement to have a dedicated gaming space mm-hmm. where when life interrupts, you know, I, I had a small child when I first started getting into this, and I know a lot of people have children and families and, and whatnot. Life interrupts when you can just leave the game up and it's fine. That is a, that is a really big difference. So I know it's, yeah. it's kind of a tough thing to just like manifest that for yourself but if you're if you find yourself having troubles and you can figure out a dedicated space you will notice a huge difference in your ability to just pause come back and pick it back up later and which oh go ahead i was gonna say my simple solution was in our guest bedroom i bought a folding table from costco that Mm -hmm. i can fold up when we have guests which isn't super often but for those weeks and weeks where we don't have guests, I have, you know, just a simple folding chair and a plastic table with game mats all over it. And that's it. Hell yeah. Yep, I had one set up next to my kiddo's giant, like, foam and rod tent castle in the basement for Mm. years. But anyway, as it pertains to two-handed solo, I find more often, because the games take longer... Um, And because it takes a little bit more bandwidth, sometimes you just I do need to walk away and either eat dinner or just take a mental break. Being able to do that and know that this is just a place where the game can stay and it'll be fine makes a giant difference. Mm. All right. Um, So kind of talking about we we touched lightly on deck building for two handed. And I know we've talked about this in episodes a lot, but I've kind of gone back and forth. 
I feel now that in general, the more players you add to Arkham Horror the card game, the mm-hmm. more the game will allow you to be specialist. Yes. Specialize your build versus being a generalist like a true solo build. I have to be able to do anything at any given time. Mm-hmm. So with that maxim in mind, I do think nowadays, most of the time, it is more efficient, reliable, and better to build two-handed solo decks still to be pretty generalist you have more space to like oh i kill most of the time but i can get clues and like oh i'd get mostly clues but i can help with enemies when i need to um but it's closer to solo than four player in my opinion yes yeah i don't think there's any better pair than two investigators who could easily do solo stuff yeah like you just when you need to team together, you're perfect. But when you do need to split the party, you can and not be mm-hmm. worried. Absolutely. Yeah, and I feel like my thinking has kind of changed on that over time. Um, there's there's lots of different two handed setups, but I think they kind of to make it simple fall into two general categories, which is either kind of two generalists. They might like we're talking about. They might lean one way or another, but they can do both. And then there's the kind of classic, like, killer Kluver two-handed setup. I think in the early mm-hmm. life of the game, I tended to do a lot of killer Kluver. Um, and as time has gone on, I've tended to prefer more and more the two more balanced setups. And Well, it helps that we have more options now. Yeah, <laughs> when, definitely helps when there's you more options. mind over matter and stick to the plan back in the old corset <laughs> days yeah, and yeah. Dunwich days. And, and I wonder if, like, the encounter design plays a part, too, that just, like, just both how the encounters are designed and maybe also our experience of it is, I think we've all kind of seen how often you need people to be in different places at once doing things, mm-hmm. either because the scenario forces you to or because you just need to be efficient in that way. Well, some of the maps are just so big. Yeah. <laughs> like... Like, even back to the Carcosa days, if you tried to do solo, um, oh god, what's the asylum scenario? Um, oh, unspeakable oath. Unspeakable oath. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. If you tried to do solo unspeakable oath, like, that could be a real bad time just because of how much movement you had to do. So, yeah. Just like in true solo, where that's a barrier, if you're running specialists, you're basically moving as one unit, so yes. you still yeah. have to account for the fact that either you both have to have movement tricks or, like, I guess safeguard is a thing for those who can take it. But, like, you're, if you're moving as one, you have the same movement challenges that a true solo deck would have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's the dimension that Arkham really adds by being, like, a map-based game. Because you would think, mm. like, in a vacuum that, like, specializing Killer Kluver would be the most efficient setup. But because of the map element and covering ground, like, it's not a lot of the time. Yep. Well, and there are certain campaigns that would straight up hard split you up. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, I think it's just TCU. But but, uh, even beyond, like, hard doing it, there are moments where something will pop up a location away. And there's an enemy or something that needs immediate attending to here. And a specialist crew may or may not have the right skills in the right places for the right things. But if you've got generalists who can kind of flex anywhere they need to, you're going to be much better equipped to just do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Killer Kluver. Yeah. Big Kahuna. Killer Kluver is my favorite way to play, but sometimes it's slow and that's, that's essentially it. Like it's effective. People are going to, the two decks are going to do what they do, but (laughs) it tends to be a little bit more of a plotting experience. Mm hmm. You know, your clue, your mo- the biggest thing is that if you're running a hard killer, they need shit to do on the turns where there's no enemies because there's a lot of yes. those turns where you're like ready and your your bullets in the chamber and then you both pull treacheries and, and you're like, well, I guess I'll draw three actions. No, 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 no. no. You, you resource, resource, resource because you're trying <laughs> guardian and you need yeah, to play yeah. your. You have such big toys in your hand, mm-hmm. but I swear or once that one enemy th- comes down. <laughs> this is the third turn this has happened, so you're just doing yeah. resources. If you draw more cards, you're just going to like hit hand size. Yeah, yeah I, I think that like experience is what kind of helped me evolve, too, is like so many of those campaigns where I did have those killer turns of doing nothing, and 
you do get more actions in two-handed than solo but still not as many as three or four player and there's a lot of scenarios where you can't afford to be like a uh, one of your two hands just kind of grinding gears and just sitting there doing resource or draw actions because you have nothing better to do when they could actually mm-hmm. be using those actions to get you towards a win. Yeah. Yep. So <laughs> it's doable, but it, mm-hmm. it certainly has some complications to, to go specialist. Do you guys have uh, class combinations that you, you particularly like together? I know Seeker Guardian's kind of the classic. Yeah, right? that's the, I feel like that that's is like the, the classic. The, yeah, <laughs> stub your toe, obvious kind of. Yeah, <laughs> I I do tend to have decent success with Mystic Rogue. Mm. I can't even fully put my finger on why. Uh, I think it might be just like general stat dispersion. Mm. Uh, the fact that rogues kind of generally can get going quickly, so they cover for Mystic's need to set up. Uh, but Mystic Rogue, I, I have had decent success with. I like Rogue Survivor a lot. I mean, they're my two favorite classes, and also, just based on what we're talking about, they tend to be able to, like, take a generalist approach pretty well. So hmm. those two tend to work pretty well for me. Yeah, It's hard to even include Survivor here, because every single Survivor is so starkly different from the last one. <laughs> they really, yeah, well, I was, they really are. I was going to say that I really enjoy Survivor paired with Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yo, dog, I heard you like Survivor. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Each Survivor investigator is so vastly different. Like mm-hmm. It's like they're the other class. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you say that partially as, a, partially as a joke, Scott, but the nice thing about where we are in the card pool is I've been experimenting recently with, like, two-handed where they're the same class. And the card yeah. pool is so big now, you could run two Guardians where one is, like, a killer and one is more of a cleaver. Yeah. Like, we have so many options now that that's totally viable, mm-hmm. and it's a lot of fun, too. Yeah. Love that. Um, so, so one of the other things for, for deck building that I would bring up is, uh, consider the complexity of your two decks. Um, if you've got one deck that's Mandy, uh, or otherwise really combo heavy and you're, you're doing searching and you're committing cards and you know, it's a lot of shuffling around, try to keep your other deck simpler (laughs) because so, uh, so so I've got to, oh, go ahead, Scott. I was just gonna say Mandy and Gloria power team <laughs> the most dirtly of dirtle. just have just never you keep one hand on mandy's deck and the other hand on the encounter deck and <laughs> yeah those are your position. two hands <laughs> uh but i i want to step farther than this the last time my uh, brother-in-law and i hung out he wanted to play arkham so i was like cool so what do you want to play he's like i want to i want to play four player i was like oh well there's two of us here he's like yep i was like oh cool so we played four-handed duo <laughs> nice Mm. so we were each playing two um which was cool that he was all excited about it unfortunately without really thinking i let him take parallel jim and joe diamond oh no (laughs) yeah well it's obvious now that i say it out loud (laughs) back when the decision was being made i didn't really think it through but uh that's a really good example of what i'm talking about here they both have those external decks that shuffle and have like effects that pop off and it's a lot to keep track of both for him especially for someone who doesn't play arkham you know a lot he plays with me graciously but um be be kind to yourself if you've got a super complex deck try to make the other one run a little bit more simply yeah i think that's the thing too with uh if you're playing in this mode like while your other player's taking their turn, if it's going to be a pretty straightforward turn, you have that extra 10 to 30 seconds to kind of think about your deck and your hand and what you're doing and all that stuff, so you can have that super complex deck. But Mm -hmm. when you're doing that, but also trying to run another deck, and you don't have those breaks in play that you can use, it becomes very difficult. Yeah, and I think, like, on that note of complexity of the deck, also familiarity, because... Like, because I like trying out new things, a lot of times I'll throw, like, whoever the new investigators together is, like, the two-handed combo. But there's also mm-hmm. something to be said of having one of the decks be someone I'm super familiar with. I know how they play in the decks. And then the other one is whatever new janky investigator we got that's super complex. Because then 
one of your hands kind of becomes a little bit automatic. Like I have my fin deck that I've run a billion times, whatever. And then the other deck can be like, I can spend my, my mental energy and trying to figure out how the heck to make that thing run. Mm -hmm. rather than trying to juggle like two brand new things together at the same time yeah i find i have to take more breaks when i'm when i'm playing two like wild decks next to each other so um and yeah we've already talked about synergies um so like just kind of throwing some ideas what are what are some pairs that you guys would recommend to people um you know for for core set players or new players considering this play style my classic power duo is Roland and Agnes from the core set. Those two, you know, Roland can kind of get things going. Skids and Daisy is iconic, but I don't know that I'd recommend it to newbies. <laughs> uh, yeah. But th those two can really handle enemies, and they've got good ways to get clues. Um, that, that, that They've done a lot of things for me. And they also are great in TSK. I know I talked about my, my power couple run through TSK, but Roland and Agnes are both very good in the Scarlet Keys. Yeah, uh, I think any, like as far as like a Seeker goes, like if you're going to kind of do uh, flexy, but half flex, I guess, of each like killer flex and clue reflex, mm -hmm, honestly, mm -hmm. something like Daisy, like you throw some mystic protection in there and she's off to the races. Mm -hmm. um, and then something like mark who's got some really weird guardian ways of getting clues like scene of the crime and stuff like that um and also just doing a damage to him and going up to five intellect yeah so one of my classic duos um that kind of goes against what i'm saying because the this is a bit more of a killer clover combo but uh they're both from earlier in the life of the game so i think might be accessible for new players um zoe windy uh not necessarily a combo that people would think but they mm. they go really well together zoe is obviously a very good killer um and windy although it wouldn't be a lot of people's first choice for kluver um is just a very good investigator and you can build her to get clues fairly easy and then the big thing that's uh for those two is they're both high willpower and they're pretty like defensively resilient against whatever the encounter deck tries to throw at you. Um, I had a blasty blast playing through TFA with Ursula and Silas. Mm. I was just trying to think back of like, what, what pairs did I really have a good time with? That was one. Yeah, that's a fast pair. <laughs> they did work. But like really, kind of like we were talking about earlier, I really think it is helpful to try to have a decent dispersion amongst the four available stats. Yeah. Um, and to have, you, know, you can have a focus. One person can be like, oh, I'm running clues most of the time, but your killer definitely needs to have clue tech. Yeah. Um, and it helps if your cluver can throw in with enemies somehow, even if it's just evading occasionally. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, moving on from there, kind of contrasting two handed solo to an actual two player game, you know, we've kind of talked about it a little bit. Obviously, there's a lot less talking. Um, Maybe. <laughs> but I think you were right, ideally. <laughs> uh, but I, I think the main thing is that you are oscillating back and forth between two strategies and two decks in two-handed solo versus just the one. So as we've mentioned, that's that's kind of the trick, is keep keep one nice to yourself, at least. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a bit slower as a result. Um, so now I know this is, this is kind of where I want to talk more about this since, you know, you two, Scott and Ian are a little bit more in the true solo camp. Uh -huh. Um, what are some reasons you might choose true solo over two handed solo or like, how do they, how do they kind of compare to each other? I think for true solo. And I think, um, uh, Reverman mentioned this in the chat too. True solo can just be fast. Like you, mm. I mean, if you're set up right, I mean, I've played a campaign in three hours, which is nuts fast. Yeah, um, that's real fast. I think if you're looking for a very specific challenge, that's what, like, true solo is a very specific challenge and re in, requires specific deck building and card thoughts and all this stuff like that. You have to be wanting true solo to play true solo. Like, if you want <laughs> to, if you, right? Like, it's just such a different beast from two to four player and so yeah that that's that's the only reason i think you'd play true solo you're looking for the challenge of true solo 
and the experience of true solo. Otherwise, I would recommend two-handed solo. That was going to be my question for you, Scott, is so with, like, we've obviously played Arkham together. You know how I play. I, I have confidence I could do either. But if I am going to dive into this and play more on my own, which would you recommend? Well, my I guess my question would be, what kind of experience are you looking to find? Yeah. So well, if I, I guess for one, one of the reasons I would do it more is just to actually play more Arkham, to get to see more of it. I'm not specifically looking for like a huge challenge, but for mm-hmm. some of these campaigns, I've only ever been able to play them once. I'd just like to play them again. And are you exploring them. your own? Are you exploring your own deck space, or are you net decking decks you know work? Let's go with a little of both. Okay, Can maybe start with net deck and adjust. I have a question: of Are you playing to explore the stories and the campaigns, or are you playing to explore the player card pool? Stories. Then I would go true solo. Okay, because I think you can play more. Uh, just being fast okay. like that and get but, i mean that's a that's a good yeah. differentiation though is for the story to do that and go fast versus if i if i had said player card what have you said two-handed uh, two-handed yeah because you're gonna get okay. to explore more of the two-handed or more of the player cards okay so yeah interesting I mean, I, i'm sorry i'm sorry i've derailed that conversation there ooh. so ian back to you about yeah. the the true solo part but that was very helpful thank you yeah like i i think i feel similar to scott i've I have been kind of straddling the true solo two-handed worlds for a long time, but I think more recently I'm kind of um, leaning more towards the two-handed camp, actually, of of which one I prefer to play more of the time. But the advantage of true solo more than anything, yeah, it, for me, is time. Just it's, it's so streamlined. Throw a deck down, you can just get a ton of games in. Um, because one of the things, too, is not just playtime, but we haven't really talked about, too, like, the non-game playing time, which is building decks, um, kind of upgrading, upgrading decks, decks, all that stuff. Like, now you're multiplying it by two. You have to do that for two decks. Whereas with uh-huh. True Solo, you know, do your upgrades, quickly flip, build it out, you're ready to go, you don't have to manage two decks, so it's... The, the, when I do play one-handed now, it's it's mostly for that, um, and like I think if you do go that route, you do also kind of just accept you're probably gonna get those games now and then where the encounter deck just combos on you, and it the swing it goes. Uh, some folks in chat are talking about the swinginess of true solo. Uh, that's definitely my experience is you can uh, listen if you go back to some of my Abandoned and Alone series of how swingy mm-hmm. it can get against you. Um, but mm-hmm. you just kind of need to be in it for that ride and just like accept that's probably going to happen sometimes. And either you make some house rules and allow for yourself to replay some scenarios when you just know you got hosed by the encounter deck or you just kind of accept that's the story you're playing. Two-handed is much more forgiving. Is is the the thesis of mm-hmm. of that piece? Yeah, you have you have some escape valves, whereas in true solo you don't. There's there's no one to help mm-hmm. you when things go bad. I always say in true solo, no one can help you. No one can hear you scream. Yeah. no one can help you scream either. It's true. But, uh, no, <laughs> gotta do all your screaming by yourself. Excellent. Yeah, so kind of talking about like general play tips. If someone's going to just start doing two-handed solo, what would you recommend? The first thing I would recommend is what I'm calling developing good play hygiene. So <laughs> like this that. means a few different things. <laughs> we've we've talked about um, the the dedicated game space being a big help. That's a help for any gaming. So mm-hmm. you know, you could go ahead and get there, but. Um, because two-handed will potentially leave you with the uh, uh, needing a break or having to step away more often, being able to leave the game up is very helpful. Um, so as far as play area configurations, I would just recommend people try a bunch out and see what feels good. My general one is I have my two investigators right in front of me and their decks on like opposing close corners of the table. 
I'm saying this like it's like it's something special. This is probably how everyone plays. <laughs> um, but the uh, and then out on the table, I've got the map, and I always keep like the encounter deck, act agenda, and all the tokens like in one spot. So that way, very specifically, if I need to reach for something, it's all right there within my my left arm's reach. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a big part of your configuration is just to have stuff in, you know, slightly ergonomic places. I've also moved just for solo play and two-handed solo. I move the act agenda and encounter deck down like within reach. I don't put it at the top of the game table. Yes, yes, like it's, yeah. it's over on the right side, so I can like just look at stuff and read the act and agenda because, yeah, it's handy. <laughs> yeah, I think the big thing for me is um, trying to avoid con any confusion between the two decks. So yeah, keeping the two decks pretty far from each other. Um, making sure I have a, like a clear area for the threat areas of both decks so I don't get confused of like who the enemy is engaged with. Um, so th just those oh, kind of building things. on that, uh, uh, set your hands down mm. in the same place every yes. time. Yeah. Can't tell you the number of times <laughs> I'll set a hand down in a weird place and then have to like scan the board for 10 seconds after I've mm -hmm. like gone and fiddled with the thing or triggered an ability. And then I go back. I'm like, wait, where's my hand? Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> just, just go ahead and set your hand face up perpendicular on top of the deck and you'll never lose it again. Um, definitely action trackers are absolutely essential. Yes. Um, oh God. Yeah. To must like, cause I do tend to always, I, always have a set like if i know i have to pause the game which happens a lot for me it's always like after the mythos phase i don't know why that's i just like when i come yep, back to the, the board being like okay now i can take my actions like you could pause at the mm -hmm. end of the round too but for me it's after mythos phase but there are times where you will get called away whatever in the middle of the game and so and you can't stop at that point so you better hope you have some action trackers so you know uh, who took what actions and when and how many they have left. Mm -hmm. Do any of you guys for, for that, that's my question with some of the interruptions and stuff, uh, have like a pad of paper or anything? So if you have to like leave, you just jot a quick note or something? Or do you depend purely on board state? I will place a token on the investigator whose turn it was mm. if I'm walking away in the middle of a turn. Like Ian said, I think it's really important, if at all possible, if the child is not actively vomiting, <laughs> make it through to the end of the next mythos phase. Because picking it up from, okay, I get to just take my turns now is the best possible solution. But occasionally, like, you'll kind of forget exactly where you were. And again, with, like with the cheating or the not playing it right conversation, you kind of just do your best. And occasionally you might short yourself and occasionally might give yourself an advantage and we just hope that, it, that your karma is neutral at the end i used to be the person who i wanted to end at the end of the turn right like so it's like i would start off in the mythos phase mm -hmm. uh but i don't know if it was you or someone else who suggested like you know stop at the end of the mythos phase mm -hmm. and that has made a world of difference mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah because when you sit back down it's like okay what was I doing? Right. All right. Yeah. Here's what I'm doing. And I get yeah. to immediately do it. It's not, what was I doing? Oh, all right. Now mythos. Let's do that. Yeah. Again. And you, and you get to start in the good place where you get to do things and stuff. <laughs> True. <laughs> Instead of getting punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and kind of like what I was talking about, I think figuring out like marker reminders or like uh, uh, reminder tokens as necessary. Um, like if you've got, uh, an ability that you need to keep a, a track of that triggers. It's nice to kind of have a separate token to denote that. Um, mm -hmm. And then as well, just, just kind of general reminder stuff is, is very helpful, but that's, that's going to vary from person to person what you need help remembering. Yeah. Shay Snark put a comment in chat that I just want to just send out to everybody in the universe. Cause I think it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. And she makes a really good point. Uh, and I've used this in other solo board gaming and just other board games in general. Go to some, like, Staples, Office Supply, Depot, whatever. Buy plastic business card holders, especially the ones that are set for, like, offices with, like, you know, like, 12 people. Mm -hmm. mm. They hold cards upright so well. And also smaller cards in various board games that have, like, multiple little decks. Business mm. card holders are amazing. 
We like that. Yeah. I might have to try that out. It's fantastic. Um, and then another hot tip from me, just uh, just to keep your visual sweep easy for enemies. This is just a thing mm. I do even outside of solo, but it, it particularly helps when you've got a lot going on. Put non-hunting enemies under the location with their edge under it mm. and put hunter or patrol or enemies you would otherwise expect need to move during the enemy phase on top of the location uh, or overlapping it at least. And you can tell at a quick glance during the enemy phase what needs to move and, and kind of take it from there. Mm. I like mm. that. Yeah, like anything that helps with quick visual sweeps of that kind of is useful. Um, I have uh, like a set of cards. I don't always use them, but they're just like, say, Hunter on them that you can like slide in their enemies. That's another kind of quick visual cue. Mm. Um, another thing that I do sometimes when I am um, dealing with the interruptions is because sometimes when you come to sit back down like unless you have it very obvious like i have had the thing where like i sit back down okay let me take my actions and then at the end i realize there was an enemy with me that i forgot about uh, yeah. so sometimes <laughs> i'll sometimes i'll like throw the enemy card on top of my investigator card or something before i leave so that or like if it's a treachery that's stopping you from doing something in your threat area so that when you come back, you immediately remember, like, oh, yeah, that thing is there. <laughs> I got to deal with that mm -hmm. right away. Mm. Yeah, so so kind of as a sum, you kind of you, you figure out what works, what reminders you need. You make sure you hit your phases. You start getting the flow down. You get, like, two, three games into doing this, and your flow will get significantly better, and it will become easier to just keep it rolling. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's kind of... Play hygiene is just making sure you've got things where it's most efficient to have them. Mm -hmm. um, other kind of like general strategy tips for, for two-handed solo. Hmm. Um, I mean, I think metagame knowledge is always applicable, but in particular in true solo, knowing what encounter cards might come out and cause specific problems for either of the investigators or when encounter cards come out, this investigator is best suited to go take care of that objective, kind of having those plans. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in general, the more efficient you can be playing, the better off you're going to be. Yeah, I think a lot of the general tips for this aspect are just like, you'll get better with time, so play sure. more. <laughs> and you'll understand mm -hmm. that like how Arkham flows and, and whatnot. But move together to start off with. I think is an easy tip. Mm hmm. And two handed solo, it is nice to kind of like stay somewhat near each other, mm -hmm. like within a location, unless you're like, unless you need to split up. Yeah. Then if you're not specializing, you can. But being like within an action to go help someone is like action engage evade or action double action to get this nasty treachery that's blocking you off of you. Yeah. Or, or do you like any, any kind of combinations like that? Like, move to you two actions to do something mm -hmm. uh, is a very common, you know, obviously multiplayer uh, 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 strategy. Yeah. And I think the meta knowledge plays into that, that we talk about, because when you know this scenario, like this location has this thing and I need to send this investigator this way and another one this way. Whereas if you are playing the scenario for the first time, I don't really know Then Yeah. I think the default is like, don't split the party and, and, and stay together until you know otherwise, but mm -hmm. just kind of depends on the knowledge you have. Um, I think one of my big strategy tips for two handed is like, might sound obvious, but use the two handed to your advantage. Like we talked about the things it gives you. So use them to the fullest. And by that, I mean like, use that engage Play action to peel off an enemy or remember that you can use your actions to clear a treachery from your other investigators threat area like no as long as you're at the same location yeah as long as you're at the same location but no like kind of how to maximize your investigators by knowing this investigator is the one who can do the most this turn so use the other investigator to kind of clear the barriers out of their way Mm -hmm. excellent um well uh justin i know you're still kind of the newbie were there any questions that we ended up not answering for you that that you still wanted to run through 
Uh, you know, I had a list ahead of time, and I, I've been trying to keep track. So I'm just going to go through it. Yeah, and yeah. If, if we already covered it and I've forgotten at this point, because it's this was this was actually really helpful to me, guys. So thanks for that. But it's also it's a lot to take in of the mm-hmm. different pieces. So I, I will probably go back and re-listen to this before I dive in. But uh, newbie questions. Let's see. So if I'm going to give two-handed a swing, like first time, step up to the plate. Thoughts on a good campaign to try it with first. I think the best one is one that you know well. Yeah. However, if we assume all of those are equal on that playing field, I think one that is a little bit lower in cl- complexity, like Dunwich or Carcosa, would probably be a good one to start with. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could do the Corset campaign, but, you know, it's over so fast, and well, the gathering's yeah. barely yeah. a scenario, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Another one I had on here. Okay, so we've talked about True Solo. We've talked about two-handed solo. This one feels odd to ask. What about three-handed solo? Like, is that <laughs> is is that a thing at that point? Are you just asking for brain burn? Is there? I mean, once you're out, I mean, is true solo the the true difference between then the others because it is multiplayer or like, how's that work? I mean, you can do it. It definitely, I think, you'll spend more time shifting between the play styles of three decks. Um, but I know like there are, there are some very dedicated community members who have done like epic <laughs> multiplayer I think, handed solo. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that was autumn. Yeah. I want to say it was, uh, or no Amber, Amber, autumn, Amber, autumn. Right? Yeah. Yes. Anyways, someone did, uh, yeah. A 20 handed solo game. It was five, four player <laughs> tables of some massive multiplayer scenario which i think is just amazing and bonkers so that that hurts my brain just conceptualizing <laughs> oh. it i mean absolute champion for doing that yeah I, nuts. I know there are people who do four-handed and because they talk about it in discord in various places um so yeah it's it's feasible i have never tried it i haven't really had a desire to i think if i was gonna do it it would only be on tts i don't really want to <laughs> manage four physical decks but that's a reasonable boundary yeah i i think it would be for me at least it would be mostly if like i really wanted to try this four-handed party to like prep for iron man or something i don't know like yeah it it would have to be for a very specific purpose i think of like wanting to see certain investigators together okay yeah i would have to be very inspired i agree like there would have to be something going on. You can do it. You are asking for more brain burn. Like, to answer your question, yes, it will be absolutely more brain burn. Totally doable, though. Okay. I feel like that'd be the sort of thing that I'd set up and, like, come back and play two turns, you know, every every few hours until it's done. <laughs> Which means I probably wouldn't play it. Yeah, and see, I, when I'm thinking of it, and the, this actually came up because... This makes sense in a second, but we were talking about Sekiro the other day mm-hmm. and the, the video. As game. we do. Yeah. And so I, I played through it, thought it was great. And then as I do with, with some of the other Soulsborne games, I would go back new game plus. And that one just, it, I, I want to go play it again. I don't want to do the new game plus cause it hit just enough of the, the brain burn on the skill ceiling. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. And mm-hmm. so I feel like if I, for some reason when I haven't even really done much with two handed, but if I tried three or four handed, I would just go, yeah, I don't need that. But I was curious about the, I was curious about the viability of it. Yeah. I'd be way more interested in doing that for like a standalone than a campaign, you know, just as a, as an experiment. Mm, Sure. Yeah. As a lark. (laughs) Okay. Let's see. Uh, I also had on here. So we've talked a little bit about how you guys prefer to play. And some of the pros and cons of of two handed solo, but I was just, I was just curious for um, those who play two handed solo. Do you mainly play it because it's your your preference, or if you could play as much Arkham as you want, but you could play it multiplayer, you'd do that, and it's a scheduling thing, and so it's just the reality of it. Or where does it fall on that continuum for you? It's a very good question. Well, it's probably not going to be a surprise, but for me, yeah, I mean, two two handed solo is the 
my preferred way for the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, it takes the swinginess out of true solo. Well, it it dulls the swinginess that you find in true solo. Mm-hmm. Um, you get to play around with the multiplayer aspect of the game. You get to try more decks. Uh, however, to give to give true solo its credit. I do love how streamlined and sleek it is to play true solo mm-hmm. when you're like me and normally you play two handed. When you then go play true solo, it's like, God damn, this is so fast. <laughs> Set up, beat, beat the scenario, tear down. It's been 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there are definite advantages, but I, I will be a two handed solo stand probably forever. Uh, True Emerald asks, when you play two-handed, you always have one investigator you like or one you're comfortable with. You do two new. It depends. Mm -hmm. When a new box drops, I am always about the new investigators. Right now, I've got got a Hank and Kate campaign. Me too. You know, with the first (laughs) builds that I've done for either of those um, going. But it kind of depends. I am trying more and more nowadays to try to coordinate my teams to actually mechanically play with each other a bit so like blurs is really good for that because you know both um both investigators can play around with that and and the synergy feels really good um another really easy one is any investigator that heals or gets a bonus from healing plus any investigator that has takes some advantage from taking damage and or horror uh Mm -hmm. those are really good pairs and and you just kind of pulling out more subtle stuff like that is more my preference. Mm. But as I mentioned earlier, if I'm like if I'm like pulling up a all search all the time Mandy deck, like the deck I'm running across from that is going to be as meat and potatoes as I can possibly <laughs> make it. Mark, <laughs> exactly. Good old Mark. Yeah, it kind of depends yeah. on the purpose for me. Like if. Uh, similarly, when a new box comes out, I just want to try a new investigator. So, like, if I can do two of them at once and two-handed, that's probably what I'm going to do. But if there's a certain investigator, especially a new one that I'm, like, having trouble with, I can't quite figure out how to make them work, then that's a case where I'll often, like, then do a campaign where I pair them with an old trusty because one, it kind of eliminates the mental load, and I can focus my energy on the new this this problem new investigator. And then also, like if I if it's paired with a deck that I know works, it helps me diagnose this other deck better because it's it's kind of like the control. Um, and this other deck is the variable where I know the other one works. So if something's going wrong, it's not that deck's fault. <laughs> it must be something going <laughs> wrong with this other new investigator deck. And that helps me kind of figure out what's going on. Is it me who's wrong? <laughs> no, it's the encounter deck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> always. It's always the encounter deck. <laughs> Similarly, if I'm trying out something that I know is kind of like cute, I will often run it with something that I know can just hit the ground running and is solid. So that mm-hmm. way, like, you know, I can, I can still have a good time. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that just gets me to my, my last question slash it's an open question, I guess. Um, obviously the tossing out there to anybody listening, if we've missed anything or there's anything else you think someone who's new to two handed would like to know, like we'd love to hear from you or I specifically would love to hear from you. So uh, send us a voicemail, shoot an email. Um, that'd be helpful. And then this is a question to to you three. Is there anything that, like, if you could pull the people who play Arkham two-handed, you would want to know, or any questions you have for others who play two-handed? Uh, I would love to know everyone's favorite power couple, because I'm sure those mm. are as varied mm-hmm. as everyone's favorite investigator, if not more so. So yeah, and build, yeah, if you call, let us know. And building on that, I would say I want to know, like when I say power couple, who's the one where you like you get fed up, and you're <laughs> you like with this campaign, couple. and you're just like, <laughs> all right, game, you asked for it. Like it, it's yeah, I'm taking you to Pound Town now. Like it's yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that that couple. Yeah, <laughs> we we all have those where you just want to unload on Arkham Horror and get some revenge. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And for me, my solo for that is Ursula Dubs, right? Like, that's mm. my power single. And I'm like, okay, this is not fun. I, you're getting the gear. Yeah. <laughs> Give him the gear. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Give him the clan. Yeah, see, I, I see for one one power couple I see over in chat is the uh, CYO anti Markovnikov has uh, Zoe and Rex. Oh, yeah. Always classic. Zoe yeah, and Rex. That's a, yeah, classic. that's a classic, just like, okay, I've had enough. <laughs> this is my revenge story yeah. now. Um, one thing I really want to hear from folks is just more. I, I can never get enough of the nerdy, like, um, as Sean refers to it, like the play hygiene tips, things you do to mm. make two handed easy, like, the thing Sean mentioned about like the hunter enemies, I'm totally going to utilize that now. So, and I'm sure everyone would love to hear those too because, I, even as long as I've been playing, there's always a way that I can make my play setup even more efficient. I'm convinced. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, for sure. Excellent. Uh, well, call into the Mythos Busters hotline. Send us a line. We'd love to hear from you, guys. Let's round this out with some tentacle time. Uh, Justin, what's been grabbing you lately? Uh, so the big one has been uh, Destiny, uh, the video game. Yeah. Um, they just launched the expansion that completes the the 10-year initial story they're telling, the light and dark cycle. Um, so, yeah, I've been playing a bunch of that, just did the the main story. No no spoilers here, but for anyone who's wondering if it's good, they I feel like they definitely stuck the landing. As someone who was with it in the first game, came over to the second game, but then bounced, God, it's got to be five or six years ago. I just, I wasn't feeling the story, the grind, any of it, but I've come back. It's great. I am satisfied with the story beats. There's a ton of fun gameplay stuff. That's been great. And I have a very, very quick real life story for it too. So in Destiny, they have a... Uh, triumph system is what it's called and basically if you do certain things in the game you unlock the ability to buy then real life swag from Bungie and so it's kind of neat it's like hey I completed um, all these things in a certain raid I get a logo for that raid and I can order it on a pin or the big bad as a, a stuffed animal something like that Huh. well coming back to this I saw which pins they had, thought they seemed cool, and I have to wear suit jackets most of the time for work. So I was like, wow, I could turn those into lapel pins, and then it could be nerdy and awesome. Well, I screwed up because I did not read the size of the pins. Uh And uh (laughs) Yep, yep. So instead of the standard small lapel pin size, this, this pin shows up, and I'm calling it a pin because that's what they call it, but it is, it's a metal. It is a silver... (laughs) Again, this is it depends on point of reference, but is a the size of a U.S. silver dollar, but then square <laughs> off two of the or like the upper edge. It's bonkers. Um, wow! So can absolutely not wear it. It would pull the lapel down. It's going to sit on my video game swag shelf over by my dishonored Corvo replica mask, and I have a fun story out of it. You should make them into cufflinks for when you want to <laughs> kill a bitch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, so anyway, I did that, uh, the other day, uh, with, with my friend Chad, uh, I got to play Leviathan Wilds. That was pretty cool. I'd seen mm. that from, um, Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. I'd only kind of basically heard the, the quick and, and dirty comparisons to Shadow of the Colossus. Mm. It's, it. You have my attention. You're, you're climbing big monsters, but you're breaking crystals on them to free them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But oh, then, more wholesome than Shadow. <laughs> right. Um, it's cool because your your um, deck is your grip. And as you're climbing, oh. if your deck runs out, then you can fall until you hit a ledge. So you have to figure out when you're going to refresh it. It was a lot of fun. Um, That's cool. So we tried it with a couple uh, couple of Iathens. I'm looking forward to trying it again at some point. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, and I think I mentioned this last time, but then uh, my brother and I uh, have been playing a little more Soulforge Fusion again. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that's me. Just, Justin, I know this is like the sixth time I've said it in as many days, but mm-hmm. like I'll never not laugh about how Soulforge started as like, hey, a digital card game that can do things that that a physical card game can't. Yeah. And then it became a physical card game, and now everyone's pumped that it's it's going back to digital. And like I was on the Kickstarter for the original. I got an email on that original from that original Kickstarter project from like 2012 or whenever that was. 
that the uh, the new app is live, and I was like, wow, full circle. Yeah. That's to awesome. to be fair, the new the new app is pretty good, and it the is the old app was fine. It, but this is time. it's it's neat because I have my physical decks, and they can be used as digital. I just they, oh, that's they, sweet. They did a good job. I Ooh. I wish more games could accommodate it. Yeah, I'll remind me. I'll show you sometime, but it's it's pretty slick. Awesome. If if KeyForge had implemented as good a system as this, it never would have went away. <laughs> sure. Hmm. We were begging for a digital KeyForge official mm-hmm. digital KeyForge. That would have been great. Yep. This is just scan the decks. They work. But how would have how would KeyForge have done that? How would they possibly have scanned it the deck? I, oh my! I, God, that was so difficult. Never worked. Yeah. Well, <laughs> It's almost, it's almost like every deck had a, key, a QR code on it. It's almost like that. It's almost like that, Sean. Yeah. And to, to be fair, there's a lot more going on in Keyforge, so I get programming it is, is more difficult. But yeah, this it's just it's very cool. So if anyone's, anyone's interested, um, let me know, and I'm always happy to screen share to show you too. Awesome. Yeah. Scott, how about you? Um, I've been playing a general mix of various games. I did get, uh, have you guys heard of Set a Watch? Yes. I just got the... But that's all. I just got the Forbidden Run, Forbidden, the Doom Run, Forbidden Isles, basically the final mega expansion for it. Um, okay. It is a co-op game where you play four heroes, so you can play four player, uh, but if you play single, you play four player four heroes and if you play two player you play two each uh, basically you always have four because that's just how the game is balanced sure. um and you roll dice and they have abilities and like sometimes you will spend dice to activate abilities and you're trying to like basically each round you go to a different location which is just a card and it has like pluses and minuses and then you get a big old line of enemies and you have to plow through them and yeah it's really great it's very rogue was it rogue light one of those sounds right yeah so anyways i just got the campaign expansion so i'm super excited to actually get into that and like sleeve everything up but i have like 600 cards i need to sleeve so Oof. yeah looking forward to that one um hell divers still taking up so much of my attention for democracy for demo- managed democracy managed of course democracy yes you wouldn't want to be a traitor to super earth yeah and then uh magic commander which is just still so much fun. It is my favorite multiplayer aggressive game, non co op, whatever you want to describe it. So awesome. Ian, how about you? Uh let's see, a medley of different things. I also um got my copy of uh Leviathan Wilds in recently speaking of. I haven't gotten a chance to play it, but Ooh. I did play kind of the original demos that they had and looking forward to delving in because that game is super fun. <laughs> Um, I forgot to mention, Ian, I also got my copy of Leviathan yeah. Wild. So, Sean, <laughs> oh, you're just the only... the only one <laughs> yes. out? <laughs> yes. We got to all God, touch I'm, tips of I'm our boxes bad. at BusterCon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Shadows of the Colossus is, like, top five game for me, too. I feel I feel really out of the loop on this one. Well, we can play Justin's copy when we're at BusterCon. Well, I don't, I don't have a copy. I I was playing someone else's. <laughs> what? Oh, like, no. You, one of us can bring our copy. Yeah, you... <laughs> Yeah. There we yeah. go. Um, and then another thing, there's a game that came out recently called Little Known Galaxy, which is like um, basically Stardew Valley in space, um, which mm-hmm. I never really got into Stardew Valley. It's not necessarily my usual genre, but they're like, okay, you're on a spaceship and you have a crew and... Uh, and Ian's like, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Once you tap into my Star Trek brain, I'm like, okay, sign me up. Yeah. So it's kind of like Stardew Valley meets Star Trek. You're a captain of a ship. You have a crew that you interact with similar to Stardew Valley. Um, you have food that you grow oh, on your cool. ship because people need to eat. Uh, but then you also like go to different planets and gather resources there. So I haven't gone too far into it, but it's, uh, it's definitely uh, my jam so far. So I'll probably keep playing that one. Um, and then the other thing is I talked before about like the, uh, the expanse, the, the TV show. So the series of books that it's based on are some of my favorite sci-fi books ever. So good. 
um, and I was totally into them. But I held off on watching the actual Expanse TV show because I just wanted that because ex- not all the books were out when the show was on, um, and I wanted that experience of like being able to read through the whole books without having the TV show influence me. Um, so that happened. The final book came out. I um, read through them all. But then, so now began the process of, like, watching through the Expanse TV show. And recently, as of, like, a couple weeks ago, I, I finally finished watching through all the six seasons. And, whew, they did such a good job. Like, it, it's tough with a book series that you really love. Um, you know, we all know a lot of adaptations fall short. But I think this is one of the best adaptations I've seen of, like, you know they're going to make some changes along the way because they have to for various reasons. But they just kind of nail the spirit of the books and they even made some improvements in some places with certain characters so definitely one of my top sci-fi shows of all time now um kind of you know i the at the very top of the hill for me is all the star trek shows of course um <laughs> something like andor no. is up there in my top sci-fi shows of all time now uh, but Andor really? Yeah, Andor. I love Andor, but uh, expand. I don't blame you. <laughs> Expanse is gonna be up there now, like in that hallowed ground, because it's it's really really good. So anyone who hasn't seen that show, because I know it missed a few people because it was on various networks, but it's really really good. I've only heard good things. Yeah, yeah. It's it's in that genre of like, um you know small scrappy crew who find each other found family but then i think one of the strong points is just because it brings in so many genres like the first book has like noir elements and there's like what i would even call some kind of like lovecraftian elements to it and then like some of the Mm -hmm. best space battles that have ever been put to screen in my opinion so just has a lot going for it interesting well cool um, I guess for my part, uh, I finished Dredge, that eldritch, creepy mm. fishing game that I talked mm-hmm. about last time. Oh, yeah. Um, would recommend, just in general, unqualified. Uh, it's it's cheap. It's quick. I don't think I even went 20 hours in on it. Uh, the ending left me gobsmacked and gawping for like a full five minutes. Wow. And then it was a, a a flurry of internet searching to see like are there alternate endings? How do you get them? Blah, blah, blah. And then and then I, there was a bit more playing, but um, it's it's a wild ride. It's fun. It's cozy still, kind of. Uh, but yeah, Dredge would recommend. I'm waiting until all the DLC comes out because I've completed the main game. There's one DLC that exists. I haven't done that yet. There's another DLC that was announced. I'm going to wait till like all the DLCs like ready to play and then uh-huh. like download it all and get back into it. So I'm sure I'll talk about it again at a future technical time. Um, but yeah, that, that was a really fun time. Uh, I have been getting hyped for the Elden Ring DLC, which comes out next week end uh, as of this recording. Uh, I went back to get my character ready and then I was like, oh, I put 280 hours into this character. It's ready. There's nothing else I need to get or do. So instead, I went and and installed Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, and now I'm going for the Platinum there to keep myself busy until Elden Ring comes out. Mm. But the thing I actually wanted to talk about is Lorcana. What? So, somewhat huh. relevant to the... <laughs> Did not see that coming. So, so <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I talked about this a little bit uh, ahead of the, the stream we did la- uh, last week, but... Okay, so Lorcana is Disney's, like, fantasy Disney game. Um, when it came out, I was kind of interested. It had, like, a cool aesthetic. It gave me kind of Kingdom, Heart, Kingdom Hearts vibes. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll try it out. I bought a couple starter decks after the shortages let up and you could actually buy product. I bought a couple starter decks, played around with it a little bit. It's kind of magic. It's kind of key forge. It's fine. I have no complaints about the game. I wouldn't say it does anything like revolutionary, like, you know, like Netrunner feels so singular, right? Mm-hmm. But like, this is another game where you're kind of like mashing dudes together. It's key forge because the win condition is actually to quest with characters rather than fight with them, but you're going to fight to take threats and, and, and whatnot off your opponent's board. 
So anyway, long story long, I got the starter decks, tried it out a little bit, wasn't completely taken away with it. So I was like, you know what? I got Star Wars Unlimited come up, coming up. I've got Arkham. I'm good. I can call it at two starter decks with this game. And that's <laughs> where it sat. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are two specific things that that game could have done to get me back into it. Number one was release an actual Kingdom Hearts expansion, mm. which they have not done. And two, guess what two was, guys? Not make it random? Buys? No, no, well, the, kind of. Uh, but they, they released a co-op mission for it. Oh, huh. so, I did not Yeah, hear so that. there's they released a... That was basically a giant Ursula, uh, <laughs> and it runs like an encounter deck. It runs kind of like a more like a player than like an uh, an Arkham encounter deck does, mm. um, but it it runs. It's kind of similar to if any of you Keyforge players out there tried out the Key Racken. It's not too different from that. It's I was better. gonna say if it's Ursula too, it's like it's, so it's just Disney Key Racken. Yeah, it's it's similar to Key Racken. It's better balanced for multiplayer because Key Racken, the way they balance that, I feel like gets worse and more powerful for every player you add, this one actually scales better. So anyway, that was enough to make me go, oh, God damn it. So I bought that expansion, which was, I was lucky to get one, because apparently it's it's a big thing for supply with that game right now. Uh, and I bought a couple starter decks and a, a small handful of packs, like a half dozen packs. I'm like, you know what, from starter decks and packs, I can just make enough that I can deal with it. Um, so yeah, it's actually, it's fine, it's fun. I don't think it did anything revolutionary, but I think as far as games that started competitive and offered a co-op thing, it's pretty good. I would be over the moon if Star Wars Unlimited did something like this, mm. and I hope they're working on something like that. We'll see. But uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. I'll, I'll bring it to BusterCon if anyone's interested. But if you're a Disney kid like me <laughs> and you kind of enjoy seeing those characters and whatnot, um, Lorcan is it's got a new corner to explore and it's the mm. one that could bring me back mm. in. I'll try any card game once. Also. Yep. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> also though, God damn it. Those, I bought a half dozen booster packs. Yeah. One of those booster packs had like an enchanted <gasps> Jasmine in it, which is, you know, like the crazy rarity. It's you know, similar to like showcase in unlimited. Huh. Yeah. And of course it's Jasmine who is like my Disney waifu. Aladdin is my favorite Disney movie. Yeah, uh, I mean solid. So choice. like I didn't know we had the same favorite Disney movie. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Disney's. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it was like, man, they should bottle dopamine like this. I went into these packs not expecting shit. I'm not looking for anything. I don't know what's in the sets. I'm just buying some packs, you know? And then I pull that out, and I'm like, oh, this is foiled different. And I go look it up. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, it's super rare. <laughs> All of a sudden, <laughs> Sean bursts awesome. into song in the middle of his house. Yeah. <laughs> Why couldn't I have that pull in Unlimited, which is a game I'm actually collecting? <laughs> but anyway. Uh, yeah, so check that out. It's, it's called The Illumineers Quest is the expansion. I think stock on it is pretty rough right now, but hopefully they get enough uh, interest that they do a reprint or they do subsequent co-op expansions. Um, but yeah, that, that was pretty cool that, uh, that they threw that in there. Nice. Excellent. Sean, well, I'm, sorry, before oh, yeah. you wrap it up, I had one mm -hmm. more thing I realized and it, it didn't make my list, but I have a band I have to tell people about. <gasps> oh, yeah. Go. Yeah. yeah, I've not even shared this in our, our playlist club chat. So... Mm. Um, when uh, when Steph and I were in Montreal last month, we went to a burlesque show, and in the lead up to the show, I was shazamming like every single song, <laughs> and <I'm> like, <laughs> my God, it's all the same band. This is great, uh, and it's a band called Boy Harsher. Okay. Mm. Um, and what kind of music? So they would probably fit like Big Umbrella, Dark Wave. Surprise, I know, because it's me, right? What? Okay, uh-huh, yeah, I um, can't say I'm surprised. Um, um, I, I actually, I was trying to think of the best way to describe it, and I found this online, and so I'm just going to read it. An ethereal voice lost in a gothic aesthetic, minimalist sounds oscillating between synth punk, dark wave, and industrial techno. Hmm. Um, it is very minimalist. It, when I listen to, to them, I... It's um, 
it's more minimal than Stranger Things, but it hits the same like synth '80s mm. type, um, sure. just center. And I'm like, I'm happy now, um, even though it's sad hmm, music. Sounds good to me. Um, but yeah, no, no, go check it out. Um, I think some of their top ones on Spotify and others they they have a bit of an underground following, so they still have a couple, you know, at least million streams. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to be sure to to tell people about them so more people go listen to them. Awesome. Be sure to share them in the playlist chat because I, I, I'm going to need help there. Yeah, I will do that. Excellent. Well, uh, super excited for everyone's summer. Super excited to get DV done and actually be able to talk about Hemlock in the coming days. Mm-hmm. Um, pay attention. To, join our Discord. Pay attention to Twitch. Check us on YouTube. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll see you guys at BusterCon in a few months. But for now, thank you for joining us for episode 166 of Mythos Busters, and we'll see you guys next time. Mm-hmm.